sales, uh, transfers of partnership interest, sales of partnership interest, sales across. And we left off, we talked last class about the consequences to the selling partner. Um, and the most sort of interesting of those consequences are the um, 751A hot asset gain, uh, which would be ordinary income. Uh, and today we talk about the consequences to the buying partner, to the buyer. Um, so let's start with looking at the code, relevant code sections. So let's turn to section uh, 742 of the code. Section 742. It's telling us what the buying partner's outside basis uh, will be. Um, and it said that the outside basis is determined under the ordinary basis rules. Um, so if it's a purchase of a partnership interest, it'll be a cost basis. So the cost of the partnership interest would go into the outside basis. If you inherit a partnership interest, your outside basis would be determined by the date of death, fair market value and date of death under section 1014. Um, and it would be a stepped up basis or stepped down to fair market value. Closely related to that is section 752. Which says that uh, a partner, an increase in a partner's share of the partnership liabilities. So this new partner that's coming in wasn't a partner before. The buying partner wasn't a partner before. Would have no share of the partnership liabilities before, and may very well have a share of the partnership liabilities um, going forward. And so that increase from zero to some positive number is going to be a deemed contribution of money, and that's going to increase that buying partner's outside basis. So that's the buying partner's outside basis. And generally thinking about it, if someone's buying into a successful business, that's going to mean that generally the seller is going to recognize gain and the buyer is going to have a higher basis, outside basis than the seller's outside basis. So the outside basis will be high. What about the inside basis? What about the partnership's basis in its own assets? Well, we go to 743, tells us 743 of the code. 743A is a very simple rule. Uh, which says that in general, the inside basis shall not be adjusted as a result of the transfer uh, of an interest by a partnership by sale exchange or the death of the partner, unless there's a 754 election in effect, or unless the partner has, ship has a substantial built-in loss. So absent a 754 election, and absent a, the partnership having a substantial built-in loss, then there's no adjustment to the inside basis. Inside basis stays the same. And so under this general rule, we now begin to see what I've been talking about throughout the class, which is that while your book will balance, so your book value on the left side of the balance sheet, plus your debt and your book capital accounts on the right side, that has to balance. Your inside basis and outside basis often balance, but not always. And here's a situation where it won't balance because your inside basis is again, in this hypothetical I'm giving you where it's been a successful partnership and partner A is selling for a big gain. The inside basis is gonna be low relative to the buying partner's high outside basis. And so if you add up the inside basis and you add up the outside basis, the outside basis of the partner is not gonna be higher because this new partner has a high outside basis um, and the inside basis remains low. That's not really conceptually the way things are supposed to work as we'll see, but it's simple. It's easy not to adjust the inside basis. So then in contrast, we have 743B, which says on the other hand, 
if there is a transfer of an interest or death of a partner, the partnership interest, uh, a partnership with respect to which the 74 election is in effect, or which has a substantial built-in loss, shall increase the adjusted basis of the partnership property by the excess of the basis to the transferee, by the excess of the outside basis over the partner's share of inside basis, or decrease in the inverse situation. So we are going to adjust the inside basis. Um, again, when an election is in effect or when the substantial built-in loss. We have a definition of substantial built-in loss down here. We'll talk about that later. And then we can take a quick look at section 754 because that's that 754 election. Seven fifty four election. Uh, it's the partnership filing the election, so it's a partnership election. Then you'll have adjustments under seven forty three in the context we're talking about. You'll also trigger adjustments under section seven thirty four with respect to certain distributions that we'll talk about later. And it applies for all distributions and transfers during the taxable year and all subsequent taxable years. So it's permanent. The election may be revoked uh, by the partnership only as provided by the IRS. And so there's, you, know, you can't go in and out of this system. Once you're in, you're in. So it's permanent, pretty much permanent. I mean, in theory, you can revoke it with consent of the IRS, but there, you know, it's going to have to be a situation where the IRS is comfortable. You're not getting an advantage from it. So once it's made, it's, it's it's pretty much permanent. And we'll see that seven uh, that 743B adjustments can be beneficial uh, and or can be detrimental. And it depends on the facts. So it's not always a win for the taxpayer. Um, so we have to think about that. The last thing we'll talk about before we uh, go into the problems, because the, 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 the tricky part, as we'll see, is going to be the 743B adjustments. And it's hard to talk about those in the absence of a particular fact pattern. So we'll defer those nitty gritty details for a little bit. But the other thing I want to mention before we get into those is going to be, what about capital accounts? What about the buyer's capital account? And that this is uh, 1.704-1B2, four little i's L. That dash one B2, four little i's is a, bait, is a capital account rules. L says that your buying partner steps into the shoes of the selling partner's capital account. And just related to that, if we go up to F, so dash one B2, four little i's F, those are the rules for when we have revaluations or bookups. And remember, we only have bookups upon certain permissible events. This is revaluations. We've seen bookups here where if a partner comes in to a partnership by contributing cash or property, a new partner comes in um, and receives a partnership interest from the partnership. Um, in exchange for contribution of property or cash, that's a permissible bookup event. And often, you know, again, will be, you know, the partnership will take advantage of that. And the, the F5 is your list of your situations where you can book up or book down property. And so one that I talks about in a connection with the contribution of money or property. So that's what we've covered thus far. A second book of event is if you're liquidating the partnership. So before you liquidate the partnership, you'll book up or down. Uh, or if you're liquidating a partner's interests. 
Um, Free the lies talks about if you can if you have a partner contributing services and getting back a partnership interest services. Four little lies talks about if uh, the partnership issues a option, which we won't cover. And five little lies talks about if you have a partnership that only has publicly traded stock securities, etc. Then you can and you mark to market. You can mark to market your capital account. So what you notice here is that a transfer of a partnership interest, a sale across, does not trigger a bookup event. So the old capital account of the seller is not booked up, nor is any other partner's capital account booked up. It just moves right over to the buyer buying partner. Okay. So any questions about the, the basic statutory scheme? All right, well, let's um, look at the problems then. So here we have a very simple problem. And this is really designed to show the impact of um, of 754 elections in this context and why they can be very quite favorable. So I'll just start from the top here. Let's we got um, so new partner. So we got a let's just say A, B, and C each contribute twenty thousand dollars of cash. And the partnership uses the $60,000 to buy uh, land. And then the partnership also generates this receivable. So it's performed services and it's owed $30,000 for services, but hasn't been paid. Partnership's a cash method taxpayer. So there's no basis, there's been no tax consequence yet. And the land goes up in value from 60 to 90. And that's unrealized depreciation. So if we created our books, the partnership books would look like this. We've got A, B, and C. We don't have to have tax capital accounts here because we don't have any 704C issues. They each contributed 20 of cash. And we've got our account receivable that has no book value or basis. It really hasn't been recognized yet. And then we've got our land. We've got no debt. Okay, so this is what the books look like before the transaction in question. Any questions on this? So now a new partner is going to buy, let's say, C's interest for 40. And C, new partner is going to pay 40. It makes sense. The land's worth 90. The receivable's worth 30. That's 120. New partner's buying a one-third interest in the partnership. One-third of 120 is 40. So, and it'll pay C 40. And we're really focused here on what are the consequences to end, but let's just start and it makes sense. Again, in an exam situation, I'll ask you, you know, what are the tax consequences to C? And we'll see that there's a relationship there that we can use. So what are C's consequences? Also, it's a good review of what we did last class. So C is selling for 40. So C's amount realized is 40. There's no debt in this partnership. So we don't have to adjust the amount realized by C share of the debt. C's outside basis is 20. That's 20 of gain overall. The receivables are a hot asset, an unrealized receivable. So we hypothesize a sale of the receivable for fair market value 
that would be 30. There's no tax basis and the receivables would be 30 of gain, 10 of which would be allocated to C. So of the 20 of gain, 10 is gonna be ordinary income under 751A. And the remaining 10 is gonna be, assuming a C held this partnership interest for more than a year, be a long-term capital gain under section 741. Okay, so C, when C gets out, C ends up with 10 of OI and 10 of long-term capital gain. And that makes sense. There's 30 of long-term capital, 30 of ordinary income built into here, 30 of long-term capital gain built into here. C's got a one-third interest of each. So um, it taxes C appropriately. Does everybody agree? Any questions on C's consequences? Okay, what about new, new partner? So now new partner comes in and new partner is gonna inherit C's capital account, which is 20. Again, there's no revaluation, no book up. So the capital account stays the same, but the outside basis is now gonna be 40 because that's C's cost basis in the partnership interest. Okay, so ends outside basis is 40, ends capital account is 20. Now we can notice here again, let's see if our balance sheet balances. We have 60 of book value on the left side of the balance sheet, no debt and 60 of capital accounts. So our balance sheet balances. Our inside basis is 60 and now our outside basis is 80. And without a 754 election here, this is gonna, this is right. I mean, it's not conceptually right. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy uh, intellectually um, because as we'll see, this ends up giving some weird cons tax consequences, but again, it's simple. So let's go back to the problem. So now what's the consequence upon collection of the receivables? And this is where things get a little weird. So let's say after N comes in, now the partnership collects 30 on the receivables. The receivables are paid. Well, when the 30 of receivables are paid, that results in 30 of book and tax gain. And that's allocated one third, one third, one third. So A gets 10 for book and tax purposes, as does B, as does C. And that's ordinary income. That's a little weird for N. And, you know, you can think about it as N bought one third of the receivables and one third of the land for cash. There's been no appreciation in the receivables since N came in, yet N is taxed on 10 of gain. That's phantom gain for N, right? It's not real economic gain. He bought it. Again, he bought one third of the receivables for 10, one third of the land for 30. Now he's been allocated that 10. He's double taxed effectively on that 10. Once on the cash that he used to pay for the partnership interest, and now again here. And similarly, if the land were sold for fair market value, there'd be 90 of amount realized, 60 of book and tax basis, 30 of gain, and each partner would be allocated 10 each. And 
And that's phantom gain for N as well. Because again, N bought his share at fair market value using cash, already taxed cash. And another way to look at it is that this, th these gains, these have already been taxed to C. That's what we tax C on. Those are C's gains. N's coming in, paying cash. Um, so now let's just see. So now at this point, we've got, um, we've got 120 of cash. And if we were to liquidate, we would give 40 of cash to each partner and A and B receiving 40 of cash with 40 of outside basis would have neither gain nor loss. And N on liquidation of this interest, we're gonna see if you have an outside basis of 60 and you receive a liquidating distribution of 40 of cash, you get a 20 of loss and it'll be a capital loss. So N's gonna get a 20 of capital loss upon liquidation. And that's a phantom loss and it just offsets offsets using that in quotes because it's really not going to perfectly offset the phantom gain that N, that N previously incurred. So this is bad news for N for two reasons. One is the phantom gain right here is going to be earlier than the loss on liquidation. May very well, you know, this could happen in year one, this could happen in year 40. All right, so just time value of money. This is a problem if you have phantom gain of X and then later on phantom loss of X. That's problem one. Problem two is we've got a character discrepancy. This is ordinary income tax at rates as high as 40% or so. This is a capital loss. It's going to offset capital gains, long-term capital gains, which could be taxed as low as you know fifteen percent. So that's problem two. And then problem three is, N could die with uh, her interest before it's liquidated, in which case this outside basis would step down the fair market value, which would be 40, and that phantom loss will disappear. So how bad of a news is this? It depends a lot. I mean, uh, it depends on how much of this built-in gain is ordinary. If it's all capital gain, then if you don't have a character shift, it could. it's gonna depend on what years these are going to happen relative to the year this is going to happen. If this, ha this stuff happens in year one, this stuff happens in year two. That's a pretty modest, you know, acceleration of income. So you might not worry too much about it. You know, is N an individual who can die, right? If N is a corporation and corporations don't die, there's no stepped up or stepped down basis. If N is an individual, you know, Think about things like how old he or she is. But it's not good, generally. Okay, I'll stop there. Any questions about problem 1A? All right, 1B. All right, now we change one fact. Now we have a 754 election as an effect. Okay, and this is where things get a little trickier. But we go back here. So 754 election is in effect. Clean this up. Now I'll just start over. So again, we got A, B, and C. Well, N. Start with N. C's consequences are the same. 754 election 
doesn't directly affect C. Seventy four election is in effect, so it ends outside basis is forty. Because seventy four election is in effect, now we're going to make seven forty three B adjustments, and those adjustments are going to create what's known as special basis adjustment SBAs for N. And the total SBA is going to equal the gain or loss recognized by the selling partner. So recall that C had 20 of gain, overall gain. So N's total SBA is gonna be 20. Now the book and the regs talk about this concept of previously tax capital and all that stuff. You can use this shortcut. Whatever the gain or loss recognized by the selling partner is, that's your net SBA, your total net SBA. So we have a total net SBA of 10, I'm sorry, 20. Now we have to allocate it among the properties. And the amount that goes to each property is gonna be the amount of gain or loss that N would recognize absent a 754 election or absent a 742B adjustment if the property was sold the next day for fair market value. So if we'd sold the receivables the next day for fair market value for 30, N would be allocated 10 of gain. So the accounts receivables get a plus 10 SBA. If we sold the land the next day, we'd sell it for 90, that 30 of gain, 10 of which would be allocated to N, so the land gets a plus 10. If we do all that and we get, we still have an amounts that are left over. So let's say the SBA was 30, meaning that N paid 50 for the interest. Then whatever's left that's not attributable to a specified asset would pour over to goodwill. But here we have no goodwill. We'll see how that works in a little bit. So Anne has an SBA of plus 10 in the receivables and plus 10 in the land. And that's just personal to N. That's N's special personal basis adjustments. It, there's no adjustment to the common basis. This is the common basis. We'll see when we do a 734B adjustment, we would adjust the common basis, but here we don't. So let's go again now. Let's hypothesize a collection of the receivables. So we collect the receivables for 30. That results of 10 of book gain and tax gain for each partner. That also allows N to recognize the loss from the SBA. He's got this 10 of SBA positive in the receivables. So that's going to then shelter that 10 of gain. He gets to recover that SBA. Now, neither of these properties are depreciable. We'll talk about depreciable property. It's a little more complicated, but basically we have non-depreciable property and SBA and non-depreciable property. You're gonna recover that upon disposition of the property. So the good news here for N is that that phantom gain that N had without the 74 election, 
and no longer has phantom gain. These cancel out. So N no longer has a phantom gain problem on the receivables. Likewise, on the sale of the land, same thing's gonna happen. 30 of gain as an initial matter divided one third, one third, one third. But then the land SBA is gonna then shelter that 10 of gain for N. And now we have again have 40 of cash, I'm sorry, 120 of cash distributed 40 to each partner. And there's no gain or loss to any partner now because their outside basis equals the cash. So N no longer has phantom gain here and here, and N no longer has a phantom loss at the end. And that's to end the benefit. Again, because of time value, money, character, potential step up and base, step down and basis under section 1014. So 74 election has really helped out N. Okay, any questions on B? I have a question on both of these. Uh, yeah. Why is the book on the land 60 and not 90? Because that's the, uh, yeah, uh, the basis of so the land was, was purchased for 60. So the book shows fair market value, which is not relevant. I mean, so I've just basically taken it back to um, first principles. And so you could have a third category. Sometimes students like to put like fair market value to sort of, but uh, that's not on the books. So the land was bought for 60 and it appreciated to 90. The receivable was, bought for zero, right? Because it was created by services and its fair market value is 30. I haven't really noticed that discrepancy before and I ran problems in another book for the same thing and I, they listed this way. Now, should this be something we're aware of or is this something just to... On this no, point? I mean, again, it's just facts, right? It's just facts. In an exam situation, I wouldn't, I would tell it, I would start out, um, well, I would give you the capital accounts as well. Um, it might give you fair market value as well. I mean, fair market value is just a fact, um, but I wouldn't make you, you know, here you had to sort of go back in time to determine this. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask you to do that. Uh, it's a little bit too implicit, you know, too, but um, again, I would start the fact pattern out by saying, you know, A, B, and C, you know, contribute 20 of cash. They buy it, you know, land, partnership buys land for 60 and generates a receivable. It's worth 30. And it's not, you know, if you think about it, it's, this line here is not really all that important for these problems. I just, I'm doing it to sort of illustrate that rule, the step into the shoes rule of capital accounts. So mostly, right, we're talking about where the tax consequences, which is this and this is the big focus of the problem. Other questions? All right, let's go back to the problem set. So who makes the 74 election? The partnership makes it. So that's gonna be potentially important, this strategic question about, well, when is it made? It's gonna be made with the partnership uh, tax return for the prior year um, and then it's permanent. And so you, know, you can think about questions about who's gonna benefit from it and who has control of it. Should it be in the partnership agreement? So you could have, I've seen it where in the partnership agreement, it says the partnership shall make a 74 election or I've seen it where it doesn't say anything. And so uh, then it depends on, um, on you know management of the partnership uh it, you could have a partner that is uh that is in charge of making tax election tax decisions so um that can be dealt with a variety of ways indeed it's talking about should new partner have conditions its purchase you know we saw again that in a new partner had a tax problem and b new partner doesn't have a tax problem and so this gets to the question of well who benefits at least immediately from the 754 election. 
And you might say, well, new partner does. But really, if new partner is thinking about things, it should affect his purchase price. And it may very well be the person that bears the burden of no 754 election to see, right? Because new partner says to see, like, yeah, I'd love to buy your interest for 40, but I'm going to have to discount it because I'm buying into a tax problem. Um, so the person that may really want it is C and not, not to say N, N can adjust the purchase price to reflect the problem. C may be the one. And so this is where, you know, if there is no 754 election in effect and C really wants it to maximize the purchase price, if A and B don't want to do it, whether out of spite to C or because there's complexity that we're going to see with 754, um, C may be out of luck, right? And this is where, you know, you start thinking ahead if your client is going to be sort of the first to sell, maybe the first to sell, you may want to insist upon having a 74 election uh, agreement in the partnership agreement, or at least having the clients have the potential, the ability to require one. Okay. So, I mean, if, if new partner is going to pay 40, then new partner needs a 754 election. If new partner, if there's no 754 election, new partner should pay less than 40. Any questions on D? All right, and E, what are consequences, uh, collateral consequences? There really are none at this, at this point to the other partners. So it doesn't have any effect. Let's go back to the balance sheet. It doesn't have any effect on A or B. Again, the SBA is personal to N, so A and B suffer neither detriment nor benefit, generate a benefit. Now, the concern that A and B is going to have is going to be now the 754 election is permanent. So that means that there's going to be SBAs when they sell it, it could be, it could be negative. Again, if we have a partnership that's gone down in value, the SBA is going to be a negative basis, effectively, and going to result in more gain. So when partnerships go up in value, 743B adjustments are good. When partnerships go down in value, 743B adjustments are bad. Um, so again, it, what are A and B concerned about with making a 74 election? One is just sort of the administrative hassle. And two, which is not great in a really simple partnership like this, but you can imagine this is not in, you know, you're not going to see a real world partnership with two assets. But also the ability to sort of benefit from those 743B adjustment if the partnership ends up doing poorly and they sell. But no immediate consequences. And then again, there's this. Uh, it, there's 734B adjustments that are also triggered upon certain distributions that we'll get to later. So there's these collateral effects that could happen in the future, right? Uh, not, well, not collateral, but there are effects that could happen down the road that may affect A and B, but nothing now. That's why this word immediate is doing a lot of work. F, will the, seven, will the SBAs affect new partners if other than collection of partnership income or sales of partnership property? This gets to the fact that if the property for which there's an SBA is depreciable or amortizable, receivable in land or not, but if this were building and this were equipment, then the SBA is, is depreciable as well. And so you'd start to give an depreciation of his or her SBA each year based on the depreciation schedule. Now we're not going to get into those kind of nitty gritty details. Again, think about how complicated that could be. And if you have a negative SBA, so you have depreciable property in the partnership with a negative SBA, such that the fair market value is less than the adjusted basis, at the time of the sale. That negative SBA is gonna create, ne create negative depreciation. 
just going to be income each year. So it doesn't, you don't wait until the end for all assets. Again, non-depreciable assets, you'll use the SBA at the end. For depreciable assets, you use the SBA over time. And let me talk about a big, very common depreciable SBA. We're gonna change one, one fact here. We're gonna have N pay 50 instead of 40. We're gonna have N pay 50 instead of 40. And what's that extra 10 gonna represent? It's gonna represent goodwill. So this is a business. Goodwill is the value of a business above and beyond its identifiable assets. Things like uh, uh, customers that keep coming back, employees that keep coming to work, even though they're not obligated to, right? They're at will employees. Customers don't have to come back, don't have to use Google every day. They're not contractually obligated, but they do. Um, or drink Coca Cola. Suppliers don't have to come back every day, but they do. So this is just this value and goodwill in a successful business is often a really big piece of the value. So let's say there's goodwill here of, uh, and if N is going to pay 50, that implies 30, uh, I'm sorry, 30 of total goodwill because N share is 10. So in that case, N's outside basis is going to be 50. And by the way, goodwill is not a hot asset. So C wouldn't, would recognize an additional 10 of capital gain under this fact pattern. So what would happen then is the SBA, there would be uh, so we can put goodwill here. There'd be now a 30 total SBA and if for N it would be plus 10 here, plus 10 here, and plus 10 here. So N would now have a plus 10 SBA and goodwill. Goodwill is amortizable over 15 years. Purchase goodwill is amortizable straight line over 15 years. So this 10, let's call it, let's make it $10 million. All right, we'll add some, we'll add everything in the millions. So $10 million of SBA basis in goodwill would yield 1 15th of 10 million of deductions each year. That would give in 667,000 of deductions each year. A and B don't get any deductions because they didn't purchase any goodwill. N purchased goodwill, so N would get $667,000. And that's usually the big benefit of a 754 election for a buyer is going to be the ability to get this, uh, you know, again, a large part of their purchase price in a successful business will be attributable to goodwill. And that allows the buying partner to get uh, goodwill amortizations over 15 years. You know, 667,000 of tax deductions, ordinary deductions, right? That's, a, you know, out of, again, a 40% rate, you're talking about you're talking about $267,000 of cash in your pocket each year. Um, not to say that these other, again, if you do it to like equipment and the like, you know, that can be useful too, but usually the step up is not huge with equipment. I mean, equipment that you get step up could be large because you get things like, uh, you know, it, the depreciation schedule is too fast, but equipment doesn't appreciate in the same way that goodwill, like Google's goodwill is humongous. Apple's goodwill is humongous. So um, you get successful businesses, that's usually the, the huge, you know, the step up you're gonna get is usually hugely uh, attributable to goodwill.
okay? And that just shows you that the goodwill, you don't have to wait until that business is sold in order to get the benefit of that. You get it each year through section 197 amortization. Any questions on goodwill? All right, back to this. Uh, so at the end of year three, the partnership had earnings, but it distributed, continued to hold the receivables and the land, assuming no 74 lakhs more part results a new partner if before the receivables are collected, he sells his interest. So back to no 754 election. This is another weird result. So no 754 election. We're back to the original fact pattern. 40. So N sells, we don't have the goodwill. N sells for 40. He bought it for 40, he's selling it for 40. So you go, okay, amount realized is 40. Outside basis is 40. No gain. And you say, oh, okay, it's not a problem. But now you got to apply 751. So what are the hot assets? The receivables is a, is a hot asset. What if we sold the hot asset for fair market value? How much would be allocated to N? Well, we sold it for fair market value, 30, N gets 10. So N's gonna have 10 of ordinary income. And then you gotta make it fit. So under 741, you have 10 of capital loss. doesn't make any sense, but that's the, that's the answer. And that's bad. That's a character. That's bad character because your ordinary income tax at rates up to whatever, 40%, your capital loss, it, if you can use it, it may, you know, it, it's going to be, uh, it, can, it will offset long-term capital gains, which should tax at very low rates relatively low rates, right? Half the rate, roughly. And then you may not even be able to use the capital loss, right? If it's a $10 million capital loss, if you don't have a whole lot of capital gains, that loss is going to be carried over to the next year. So bad swap, you know, you don't want to get ordinary income and a capital loss. Those don't equal out, those don't offset. And, but that's just the result. And so N would have that. And of course, buyer is gonna step into the same problem because there's no 754 election, buyer is gonna have the same problem. And again, buyer would likely reduce the purchase price as well. If there is a 754 election in effect, then upon this sale, as hypothetical sale of the receivables, that SBA is gonna be used to cancel that out. There will no longer be 10 of ordinary income recognized by N upon the hypothetical sale of receivables because the SBA will shelter that. So that ends up being zero. And then there's no capital gain or loss either. So if the 74 election in effect, then N has neither gain nor loss. If there's no 74 election in effect, then N has a 10 of ordinary income and a 10 of capital loss. So this just shows you that, you know, this problem that's created doesn't go away upon liquidation. So if with no 74 election, so in G, the answer is N has 10 of OI and 10 of capital loss. In H, N has neither capital loss, nor ordinary income, zero. And then buyers would end up having the same uh, 20 total SBA allocated 10 each to the receivables and the land 
just like new partner did. Be the same analysis. Okay, questions on that? All right, in J, capital accounts. Capital accounts, we, took, we said it was 20, um, um, and the new partner's capital account will be 20, stepped into the shoes with respect to capital accounts, whether a 74 election is in effect or not. 74 election has no effect on capital accounts, and we know that capital accounts are not booked up upon a sale of a partnership interest, upon a sale across. And then K, you know, gets to some of the administrative complexity again. If you have 74 election in effect, then every time you have a sale, you're gonna have SBAs that are personal to that partner and SBAs in each and every asset of the partnership other than cash or property that has no built-in gain or loss. And so you can imagine how tricky and complicated this can get if you have a lot of assets and a lot of sales and creates a lot of work for your accountants. So that's one downside of 74 election. It's just complicated. Okay, any other questions on one? Okay, in two, we have a somewhat more complicated uh, fact pattern here. But um, again, we each partner <coughs> contributed, we, we can walk it back to first principles. Each partner contributed 20 of cash. The partnership borrowed 30. This is a general partnership with three equal partners. So that liability is gonna be shared one third, one third, one third. So each partner's outside basis goes up to 30. And they take the 90 of total cash, 60 was contributed by the partners, 30 was borrowed at 90. They buy inventory, land, building, and they generate this receivable for services. So D is buying C's interest for 60 of cash. So in A, we're gonna go, and there's a 74 election in effect. So we're gonna go through this and we're gonna say, okay, what are the consequences for C, the seller? What are the consequences for D, the buyer? So we go to start with C, the seller. C's amount realized is 70. The 60 of cash plus the 10 of 752 debt share. Right. That's uh, 752D requires that. That's a C share of the debt goes into the amount realized when C sells her interest. C's outside basis is 30. So C has 40 of gain. What are the hot assets? The receivables and inventory are your hot assets. So if we hypothesize a sale of each, that would be 30 of gain for the receivables and 30 of gain in the inventory. That's 20 of hot asset gain. I'm sorry, that's 60 of hot asset gain, 20 of which would, be, would have been allocated to C, the selling partner. So there's 20 of hot assets gain. So 20 of ordinary income, the remaining 20 is 
long-term capital gain. She's held the partners minutes for more than a year. So that is the seller's consequences. That's what the seller reports. Questions on that? Okay, the buyer D, D's, you know, we can put this up, D's capital account is gonna be 20, just the cash that, that C contributed. D's outside basis is gonna be 70. That's the 60 of cash plus his share of the liability, 752A. So, and the SBA is gonna match up with the gain that C recognizes. So D's total SBA is gonna be 40. And now we have to go asset by asset to see how that's allocated. And so we've got a receivable. Again, we ask if the receivable had been sold right away, how much gain loss would be allocated to D absent the 754 election. So the receivables were sold for 30, D would have been allocated uh, we get 30, there'd be 30 of gain by the partnership. D gets 10 of it, one third. So the account receivable has a plus 10 SBA. The inventory, if it were sold for 60, there'd be 30 of gain, 10 of which would be allocated to D. That's plus 10. That's basic, that's this. The land, if it were sold for fair market value, the land is actually worth less than its basis. So the land, if it was sold for 15, there would be 15 of loss, five of which would be allocated to D. So the land has a negative SBA of minus five and the building were sold for fair market value. There would be 75 of gain it would be alloc uh, uh, 25 would be allocated to D, so you plus 25. And so we sum that together and it should net to plus 40, which it does. So these are D's SBA. receivables and the inventory and the land, that'll be recoverable upon disposition. So D will have an addition, a 10 of loss on disposition of the receivables, a 10 of loss on the disposition of the inventory, a five of gain on the disposition of the land. The building is gonna be depreciable just like a building. So it'll be like over 39 years straight line. So that would result in immediate depreciation deductions that are personal to D. Okay. Questions on A? Okay, in B, now he's paying 70 and this gets to the goodwill. So now he's paying more than his share of the identifiable assets. And that excess represents goodwill. So now what would happen to C is C would now get 80 of amount realized. It's paying 70 of cash. There would still be 20 of OI. Now there's 50 of gain. Now there's 30 of long-term capital gain. That extra 10 is the 10 of goodwill. That C has a third of effectively. D's outside basis is now 80, because it's 70 of cash. And now when we have a premium that's paid and we go through this and we say, okay, the SBA is plus 50. We go through each identifiable asset and we only get the plus 40 whatever's left is now 
goodwill. And goodwill plugs the difference. So now we have plus 10 of goodwill SPA. That's going to be recoverable through depreciation, amortization technically, over time. And if the business were sold, partnership sells a business, the goodwill will go along with it and be recovered that way too. Right? But generally, uh, it would just be recoverable through annual amortization deductions that D gets that A and B don't get. Okay, questions on that? So that's just another illustration of the extra value being goodwill. And again, that's usually a big number. We have some you know, examples here where it's relatively small, but you can imagine a number where the biggest chunk of that SBA by far goes to goodwill. And so a lot of times, if you're even trying to estimate the value of a, of a, of, of a, of a, of a 754 election of 743B, that you're trying to evaluate it, oftentimes the, a rough approach would be just figure out how much, assume the entire step up is going to goodwill, and then run the numbers there. You know, uh, requires you to do present value analysis to see what the present value of that goodwill step up is. But that's how significant it usually is, that that's usually the biggest piece of the puzzle. And so lawyers, in terms of eyeballing this, would focus on that in, in, a, in a typical case. Um, okay, the last thing here in two, now we're going to combine 704C with this. And so now, C had contributed the accounts receivable. So C's contribution was no longer cash, but is now receivable. And the fair market value of receivables was 30 and the basis was zero. So C contributed 704 C property now. So now we we'll go back to this, you know, we're changing the facts. This problem, yeah, I would, again, yeah, not, I would make it a little more clear in exam situation what's gone on. But if we go back here, just clean this up. So now C, uh, the amount realized is 70 again. We're back to 60 of cash being paid plus the 10, 752 share. What's C's outside basis? Well, that changes because instead of contributing cash, C contributed receivables with an outside basis of zero. So C's initial outside basis is zero, but then C gets a one third share of the liabilities. So C's outside basis is 10. The zero, zero basis receivables plus 10 under 752A. So C has now 60 of gain. So now we identify the um, hot assets. So the inventory is still hot and that's pretty easy because we sell the inventory for fair market value of 60, we'd have 30 of gain, 10 of which would be allocated to C. So 10, C has 10 of 71 ordinary income with respect to the inventory. With respect to the receivables, with respect to the receivables, this is 704C property. We would, the book value is uh, 30. The tax basis is zero. If we collect the receivables or sell the receivables, we would have zero book gain and 30 tax gain. We would allocate the book gain, zero, zero, zero. 
give A and B, the non-contributing partner, zero of tax gain, the remaining 30 of tax gain goes to C. So upon this hypothetical sale of the hot assets, C is going to get 40 of ordinary income. That's 10 from the inventory, 30 from the receivables. And that's 704C, it's doing that work. And now 20, the difference is gonna be long-term capital gain. So that's C's consequences. And all we did is just added something that now because one of the hot assets was 704C property, we had to run through a 704C analysis to figure out how much ordinary income is allocated to C under 71A. Turning now to D, the buyer, now, this is a situation where if there is no 754 election, D steps into the shoes of C with respect to capital accounts and 704C liability. So this is where D buying C's interest is worse without a 754 than D buying A or B because D is buying into C's 704C problem without a 754 election. So it's even more critical for D to ensure a 754 election is in effect. And if it is in effect, then we have a total SBA of plus 60 that matches up with that. And again, we go through the assets. Let's do account receivables last. Well, account receivables, we would again ask, what if we sold the receivables the next day and there were no 754 election in effect? how much gain would, or loss would be allocated to D? Well, 30 of gain. So since 30 of gain would have been allocated to D, under this hypothetical, he gets plus 30 in the receivables. And everything else is the same. The inventory is plus 10. The land is minus five. And the building is plus 25. And this plus 30 receivable is what's gonna protect C, D, when the receivables are sold or collected, that in the first instance, he gets allocated that 30 of gain, but then it's gonna get washed out by the 30 of loss because of the SBA. So that's the answer to C is just D's outside base. This is going to be 70 and his SBA is going to be plus 30 for the receivables, plus 10 for the inventory, minus five for the land, plus 25 for the building. Okay, questions? All right, we've got five minutes left, so we won't be able to finish this problem here in three, I don't think. So we'll continue on with it. But just here we have a losing partnership. The partnership, the value is less than its basis. So it's got a built-in loss of 200. And if there's a substantial built-in loss, which is defined as 743D, as a built-in loss in excess of 250,000, then we have mandatory 743B adjustments and they'll be net negative. Here without a 74 election in effect, and there is no um, substantial built-in loss, here 
a 74 election would actually be bad uh, for the buying partner and then indirectly the selling partner. There's, you know, without, when you have an appreciated partnership, without a 74 election, you have early income, early phantom income followed by later phantom loss. If you reverse the situation, so we have a built-in loss, now you have early phantom loss followed by later phantom gain, um, which again, can very well be favorable. So um, the answer in A, and again, I'll defer this to next week, would be that when the tables are turned, we prefer not to make a 754 election. You sort of stick this one out, stay, uh, sit this one out. Um, now, again, it's a pretty limited advantage because once you get into um, a built-in loss of more than 250, so if the basis were 400, 400,001 dollar, then you're you're going to have your SBA whether you like it or not, whether whether you have 74 election or not. It's coming. It's going to come. But here we have the ability to sort of play a little bit of a game and not make the 74 election. And we'll see later on or on Monday we'll see why that's uh, beneficial. Um, but again, I'm not gonna rush through this problem. We, we shouldn't should spend that much time on it. So we'll probably spend 10 or 15 minutes next class and then we're on to the next assignment. So any questions about any of this stuff before we sign off? All right, well, hearing none, I'll see everybody on uh, Monday. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.